Ladies and gents, boys, girls, hello and a very warm welcome from the viral workshop. It's the end of a long work day. Now I use the time to record a video. I got footage from a former pro mountain biker. Her name is Gisela, she's from Germany, 61 years old, essentially taught herself how to row. Um, she said she watched a lot of my videos. Thank you so much. And she said, that's the reason why she rose so well. I don't think so. You're super talented. Look, that's her. Try to blow up the picture a bit. I know the resolution is not brilliant. If you look at her row, and that's the reason why I picked this video. If you look at her row, it looks awesome. It looks really cool. There's not much to argue. Say, oh, well, blade clearance, maybe a bit. Blade's a bit too far off the water at the catch. Okay, these are first indicators. But the question is, I mean, how do you, how do you make someone better uh, at 61 years old learn to row late, rows that well. What can you do? And then looked at the video a bit closer and I found a couple of very interesting points I would like to point out today, share them with you and see if you agree or not. So the first thing you will see, somehow the stroke is lacking dynamic. Now dynamic is an often overused term. You should accelerate throughout the drive. And the question is, well, what should you accelerate? Uh, your head, your back, your butt, your seat, your handles, the boat, what? Ultimately, you have to move the boat, not yourself. So that's one of the prime factors. If you're interested in that, let me know. I have the vague idea to put together a collection of a um, completely overstated dogmas and myths. So essentially rowing, myth busting about technique and training planning and how you should do what you should and what you should not do, in my humble opinion. If you're interested in that, let me know. I happily start a series on that. And maybe you can come up with some, hey, I always learned this should be the case. Is this true? Happily do this. Um, my other idea was to um, start a library of videos talking about how to do what. Let's say your upper body pivots to early at the catch. Why is this happening? What can you do? If you're interested in that, please let me know if this is how it can help my rowing community, I happily do that. Now, back to you, Gisela. Why, why is it lacking dynamics and what kind of dynamics are we lacking? Well, we don't want to accelerate the hands because if you aim to move your hands, what effectively, <laughs> what effectively happens is that you overdo it, you over accelerate. And ultimately, I found that there are essentially two principles and I will probably stress them in many videos to come and I might make specific videos about these. Principle one, and it's not so much that it's true, it's what it does to the body and what, how it affects boat speed. And I found this to be super, super helpful. Principle one, don't move your hands, move your feet. And I said, well, if I push my feet away from myself, the, but the boat should travel towards the bow. Yeah, this is why you get oar locks. And these oar locks transfer the way the energy travels. So this is why we push it away and we still go in the right direction. That's rowing. You know, you can, <laughs> you can look back and still be fast forward. That's rowing. You can't be fast looking backwards. Oh, we are rowers. We can do this. Okay. So, and principle number two, from catch to finish, always at any given point of time, if possible, make the utopias possible, have equal amount of force on your hands and on your feet. Okay. So equal amount of force on your hands and feet. And the second, move your feet. Don't aim to move your hands. Then you don't have these stupid ideas like ripping at the finish and being aggressive at the catch. Hey, if you kick too hard with the legs at the catch, you can't transfer all of that. Okay. So it's going to kill you and you never end up with the same amount of force on your hands. Now, Adi, my partner in the company, he's 83 years here. It's going to turn 83. We had, we had a leg press at my own rowing club and you know, we were always doing, we were doing more weights than you could actually stack on this thing. So instead of ma making the rig for the plates wider, I think we did 360 kilos or so, or 350, 370, absurd amounts of weight for rowing. You don't need that. And then he did one simple thing. He didn't widen the rig so we could put on more plates. We had actually athletes sitting on top of the leg press plus the weights to make it even possible. I said, no, 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 no. He mounted handles. I said, okay, and now don't support your back. Hold on to your handles and now push again. And all of a sudden, the weight dropped to 60 kilos, 70 kilos, ta-ta. Rowing is about how much you can transfer. 
It's not about how much one single muscle group can do. It's a game of transferring energy. Okay, that makes sense. So, and if our legs overdo it at the kitchen, our hands don't have, don't end up having the same amount of force. I want to see somebody who can actually transfer 300 kilos through the body. That's 600 some pounds. And, and through his arms, in, in, virtually impossible. And the, the, the issue that we have here is that there is no dynamic in not hands, but both acceleration. The thing is that you can fake dynamics to a certain degree. There's a bit of a caveat. How much boat dynamics do we actually want? How much acceleration do we actually need? Well, we need some, but not endless acceleration. If we have too much peak acceleration in a stroke, we will actually create so much water resistance, initial water resistance, that the ratio of energy input to speed output is not very beneficial. So we need the most steady boat speed we can generate. How do you do this when rowing is such a cyclic motion? It's not like a bike or a sailing boat where you can optimize the hull shape. No. You have acceleration and deceleration, acceleration, deceleration. It's, it's a continuous game of change of boat speeds. And the ones who master to be as consistent as possible are the ones who are going to be fast. And this is sometimes, especially in quadruple skulls, you can have Physically speaking, lousy athletes. I've seen this even in Austria. There, were, there, were, there was an under 23 um, lightweight men's squad. There was one athlete in there. He was lazy and lousy. And I mean, I don't want to do any wrong, but that was my impression. Cocky, obnoxious. I mean, name it. All the bad attitudes. He had them all, but there was one thing he could do. He knew how not to stop a boat. And that means a lot. And they were actually quite, they, they meddled. They were quite successful, and you got to give them credit for that. Credit who credit who credit deserves. So, the idea to understand how to let the boat travel that's hugely important. That is massive, and this is what this guy had. So, if you understand how not to disturb boat speed, and then how to give it a nice and continuous acceleration throughout the drive. This is the kind of dynamics we're looking for. But if we look at Gisela, she is doing something where you would say, well, she's lacking dynamics, but in which way? What you actually perceive, or I perceive this to be the case, is that the body motion does not correspond to the boat motion. There is too much body motion and too little boat motion, and that's what's odd for the eye. Let's see. Here at the catch, she starts the drive. The thing is, there's always going to be a wash in and always going to be a wash out with the blades. It is a utopious idea to say, I perfectly, in the 90 degree angle, put my blade in the water and it's going to stay there when I'm ready to go. No, welcome to reality. The boat is moving through the water. The difference in speed is too much. You have to wash in. And at the finish, you have to wash out. If you're rigid, you stop the boat all the time. This is why robots can row. So you have to wash in. That washing is not the issue. The issue is what happens to the body. Now look at that. The, the upper body rotates around. Does it rotate around the hip? No. And that's the tricky part about this video. This is why I selected this footage. She rotates around the upper section of the trunk. Because the pelvis, when usually we'd say, can you see this? Usually we'd say, okay, it's a pelvic rotation issue. I probably have to be here. It's, it's a pelvic rotation issue right there. We say, okay, I cannot, ah, I cannot really rotate. I'm at, at the catch when you hear, oh, you immediately lose it. So you rotate around the hip joint. No, that's not the case. Gisela is actually strong. She can hold it. What you can't do is control the shoulders. And I found this to be an interesting <sighs> phenomenon. No, it's one of the two main components that are responsible for your hands going up, your blades going deep, and you losing all your pivot potential, leverage potential throughout the drive. It's either the pelvis or and, and or the shoulders. 
Now the question is, what should you do with the shoulders? I've recorded a separate video about shoulder work. Um, I may publish it, I'm waiting for some more footage. So I might, be a I might do a specific videos on shoulders. Subscribe if you want to see this. The issue here, can you see me if I hop on a bar rower? So the issue here is that there is not sufficient or insufficient stability around the lats. So here at the catch, this happens. So why? What the shoulders need to do on the way forward, there's actually a lot of shoulder motion going on. So the way it should look, in my humble opinion, is like this. You should not be able to tell whether it's recovery or drive. Now, how do you do this? Should the shoulders be loose? No. Should they be tight? No. They should be huh, in French. There's such a good word for that. And it's called arrête, which essentially means lock. And, but arrête puts it much better, I think. It's when you hear it, the catch, you have on a, on a recovery, you, loose, you loosen up your shoulders, and then it's a question of whether you go over the top of the shoulders forward or on the low end. And you have to go forward on the low end, and the last part where you reach out, you actually do this. So instead of going forward, you do that. And that opens up a bit of the rib cage. You give your lungs a bit more space, and at the same time, you lock your shoulders with the help of your lat in place. And then when the drive starts, you use, I use, the lat to transfer the energy from back into my feet from the hands. So hands, lat, down into, the lat is a pretty long muscle, into the core, and then glutes, and then we are in the legs. And that connection, glutes to lat and low back, is huge. That is so important. And it takes lat and a bit of chest. So it's the muscle I'm referring to is the top of the chest right there. So not here, but right there. Lat, armpit, and that, the, that muscle that connects essentially your shoulders to your chest. And if you contract this a bit, it helps you to red lock your shoulders in place. If the shoulders should, visually speaking, remain steady, you have to put in a lot of work. So there's actually quite a lot of counter motion because if you didn't do anything, your shoulders would be all over the place. And if, Gisela, you were able to control your shoulders and lat better, you would actually not be forced to rotate. I believe you may have spent a, a fair amount of time on a linear erg. And I see this quite a lot of people who do a lot of linear erging. On a linear erg, you always pull on a bar and you go forward. And the way, your best means of getting more reach is to be round and to be stiff in your shoulders because there's a lot of linear load. So it's overloading the shoulders. It's not where you reach out like in a boat or in a biro or any boat native setup. No, you go forward and you, in that, I mean, your spine is suffering. And then you, you simply have to hold <laughs> as much as possible and withstand that for most of the drive. So what happens is that your shoulders actually stiffen up. If you do this over the entire winter season, gradually your shoulders will become stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. You lose the idea what it's actually like to go out to go across, to go together and out again. And if you transfer that stiffness into the boat, you've got, a, you've got an issue at that position because then your shoulders should be going together because your arms are going together, but they can't, they are too stiff. So you've got to give way somehow and you do this by going up. You give way to stiff shoulders. I believe this is Maybe not the entire cause, but a good deal of what's going on here. It's barely visible. And the rest is essentially a result of that cause. Because your upper body pivots too early, you bend your arms too early. Why? Because you go over the top of your shoulders. 
So it's natural to do this contraction. If you were low, you could bend your arms, but it would involve the lats much more, which would help you to get the force, the energy, right into your core. But if you go over the top of your shoulders, you always load your spine. So you are in a linear fashion load. And the boat doesn't want that, doesn't need that, works in a different way. And then at a stage where there's a good amount of leg drive left and the upper body should engage its swing, this is where I was referring to dynamics. There is no upper body swing happening because it's been wasted here. And what this does, it creates a force curve with a very early peak. Um, I, will, I will try to show you in a minute. And that very early peak means you peak around now. And just around perpendicular when your oars are overlapping, you're done. This is when you cannot continue to have the same amount of load on the blade as you had here. So essentially, the main, the main acceleration phase is you getting in a bit too late because the shoulders are so stiff, because you cannot reach out, because there's too much rigidness in your shoulders. And then you rotate too early, so the upper body swing potential is, is gone. And then the leg drive works into an upper body that is in a pretty bad angle to transfer energy because you are pushing with your quads and at the same time you have to activate the, the, the glutes and hamstrings quite a bit. That is good to hold stability, to hold a stable position, but it's not good to move something else, move the feet. So when you want to create a motion, you actually want to have an imbalance between the two large muscle groups, agonist, antagonist, your quads and hamstrings. Of course, you always need a bit of an antagonist, that's true. But if you want to create motion, one has got to be dominant. And that's not the case here, because the upper body engages too early, which is the entire posterior chain that's been activating. And now at the finish, you would like to lean back a bit more, but you're losing connection. So the classic solution I see it is all the way up to Olympic level. Well, just cut the upper body at the finish short so you don't lose connection. Boom, no upper body swing, it's just pure empty arm pull with a bit of a washout. The washout is a result of the wash in. The more to wash in, the more to wash out. There's no much you can do at the finish. It all happens at recovery. So how to solve it at the finish? Arms forward, don't bend, don't extend 100%, keep them slightly bent. You could hold the knees down a bit longer and make sure your arms stay loose until three quarter slide. And I like to have a bit of a looseness in my elbows. To me, it feels like going forward, a slight looseness in my elbows, then I reach out. And that reaching out cannot be done with stiff arms. You cannot go out. <laughs> you don't want to punch anybody. And that's, that's the issue with the stiffness here. So maybe what you could do, Gisela, you could actually support your upper body weight with your pelvis a bit more. Say, okay, I rotate here a bit more. Can you see this? No, you can't. Jump behind the by rower. Okay, so you rotate here a bit more. Say, ah, oh, okay, okay, that's good. And now I'm free to move my shoulders. A good test, I wouldn't do this when it's cold, but on the bar you could go to the catch and let go of your oars. You can do this in a double. Can you, and is it comfortable to stay in the same position or not? If yes, perfect. If no, well, you found that the catch is not uncomfortable, but it is not sustainable because you want to sustain the same position. It should be easy to attain a position and easy to transfer energy um, every two seconds, a stroke rate 30 over a 1K race. And therefore, it's important to be as energy efficient as possible. Alrighty, good. Now, I'm, I'm going to hop on a by row and show you what I perceive your force curves look like. All right, guys, I'm rowing feet out here, so there's not my workout clothes. I just want to show you general tendencies. This is a by row pro. Uh, it's on the assembly platform. It's not. It's said to be stable. You can actually make it unstable. And it's said to sculling. You can also do sweep rowing. So let me show you a couple of sculling curves. So if you've never seen how this works, um, you've got the left force curve on the t on the bottom over a timeline. And if you look at the um, the y-axis on the left, these are the newton. And then you got the right force curve, which is the red one. Essentially, this is your handwriting. How do you move 
the boat. It's how, how do you distribute force? And you could also go to the balance mode where you have a force by angle curve separate left and right. So let, let's try to use this mode. It's probably easier to grasp. So the curve, I think, that Gisela produces in the boat looks a bit like this. There's a bit of a weight, then it's peak, and then there's a decline with, with a last attempt to provide, to, to uh, move the boat. So peak before zero, boom, gone. It's important to move the boat around zero because if you do this, what happens is that you're actually able to uh, propel the boat when the blades are in the best possible angle to move. And if you don't do this, if you lose it here, you essentially waste great potential. I know that the majority of our drive happens from catch to just past zero. So you cannot extend the drive to endlessly past zero because the boat picks up too much speed. However, if you use your upper body wisely and you pivot late and you control your shoulders, you can have somewhat of a plateau and still generate force around mid-drive. Now, there's much more to be said. I hope this video was interesting for you. If it was, give it a thumbs up, share it, like it, and subscribe to the channel. This is a Biro Pro. Go to Biro.com to learn more. And if you want to work with me, my website is rmtraining.com. Now I'm very much looking forward to your comments. What are your takes? What do you think? What, you, what, what is it that you would suggest to Gisela to improve? All right. I'm just about to send out a new newsletter. There's a rowing camp coming up in June in Vienna, in Austria. If you haven't registered for the newsletter yet, go to rmtraining.com and we will send out all the news there in just a few days. All the information also on armtraining.com. I would love you to join us. It's a five-day camp in Vienna and it's going to be a lot of fun. With this being said, thanks for watching. I see you in the next video. Bye-bye. <laughs>